So today, again, some of you, well, Alessandro, you mentioned, but we, we have been working together with him and, and Serena on some topics that I will touch upon at the end of my presentation. But today I wanted to give you a very broad overview of what we are interested in. And uh, you can see that the title is uh, fairly uh, broad, not to say vague, but it has a meaning. So eventually, I hope during the presentation, the meaning of this presentation, the meaning of this title will become clearer. So um, let me start again in very broad uh, and ample uh, uh, sense. And so probably we all agree that a disease is, generally speaking, is a, the result of a loss of hemostasis. And probably aging is the best example of this loss of homeostasis. And it is sufficient to look at the skin of a, a young person versus an old person. And you can see immediately the difference. And you immediately get what, what I mean. And importantly, aging is not just about wrinkles. Aging is the greatest risk factor for many diseases, including, uh, uh, in, including cancer. And this is more impactful than uh, uh, alcohol consumption, or or smoking or obesity so it is really it is really making making a, a significant impact of course aging is fascinating it's complex and we are a cell biology lab and so we break down complex problems in in, in, in simpler uh, ones and we interpreted the aging as the result of the sum of the age of the uh, of the cells, so we age because our cells age, and age cells are known as senescent cells. These cells are dysfunctional cells; they are unable to proliferate. They spread inflammation. They have this senescence-associated secretory phenotype known as SASP, and this causes a general frailty in the system, which makes us more prone to diseases. So it is something which start cell intrinsic, again, through this uh, SAS, through this release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, becomes a systemic problem. So the question is then, what, what causes this, the, this loss of homeostasis, which is initially cell intrinsic, and then becomes uh, systemic? Because in principle, the cells have all the means to keep themselves young and in pristine conditions. They can make anything that breaks down, they make a new version of it. There is only one component in the cell that if damaged, if, if broken, cannot be replaced. And this is our gene. So do we age, do cells become senescent because they accumulate the DNA damage in our genome? And the answer would be, yes, there is very good evidence in the literature that DNA damage accumulates with aging. So that would be probably the end of the presentation. Yes, we have a clear answer. However, DNA damage, and this is something that I realized when I was assembling this slide, in fact, is repairable. And that means that lesion will be transient. So how can a transient event, like a lesion, transient because it is repairable, how can it lead to an irreversible event like cellular senescence, because cell senescence is irreversible. So we have to slightly probably change this, this paradigm. And, and this is, uh, and we can change it also on the ground of some experimental evidence because we and other groups actually demonstrated that DNA damage is not always repairable in food. And so what we observe is that if you take cells, you expose them to random DNA damage that will break DNA throughout the, their chromosomes. Well, what we discover that each lesion, of course, will trigger a DNA damage response, but those few lesions that happen to occur within the tumors, which are the very tip of the linear chromosomes for a number of evolutionary reasons that today I will not have the time to discuss. Well, those lesions will not be repaired. They will persist, and this will cause a persistent activation of the DNA damage and response pathways. Okay. And so tumors as a, as a hub that collects DNA damage with time, of course, associated with the induction of the process known of cellular senescence. Of course, it probably is not completely novel to, uh, uh, to, to associate tumor biology 
to the processor senescence because we and others have previously uh, uh, reported that tumors, of course, with time in normal cells become shorter and shorter and shorter because cells cannot fully replicate their linear uh, genomes, the linear chromosomes, and eventually tumors become too short. And again, this triggers a persistent DNA damage response that causes cells to arrest and become senescent. So again, it's the loss of tumor integrity, more in general, both the telomeric DNA damage accumulation that I mentioned here, and the telomeric shortening that we propose to be the irreversible event that causes uh, cell senescence and cell aging. However, probably would be wrong to think that DNA damage causes aging because DNA damage needs to engage, to activate the DNA damage signaling pathways, the so-called DNA damage response, which is the real mediator of the DNA damage that enforces cell senescence. And this is probably a simplified version of the DNA damage response. There are many factors that basically jump at sites of DNA damage and they accumulate there. We call them foci. So these are DNA damage response foci for a number of, of factors. And eventually they mediate the transient checkpoint, the cell senescence establishment, and also cell death, or also they make, can make yeah, it's an important impact on the, on the differentiation of stem cells. So this is the canonical view of the DNA damage response. However, in recent years, we discovered there was something missing in this, in, this, in this cartoon, without which you would not get the enforcement of the checkpoint, the establishment of cell senescence. You wouldn't even get the formation of all these DNA damage responses. And what we observe is that you need to synthesize and process RNA at the sites of DNA damage in order to make all these things described in this cartoon uh, to, to occur. Things are complicated because we are comfortably a DNA damage lab and then we have to become an RNA lab to understand what the hell was going on. And so I'll summarize very briefly in one animated cartoon what uh, was our uh, um, not easy a path through this, uh, the understanding of these events. So then I can discuss more in detail the consequences of these findings. So what we discovered that when DNA breaks, these lesions are recognized by uh, the sta a standard um, um, sensor of DNA damage, the so-called MR11 RAD50 MBS1 complex MRN. So MRN uh, recognizes DNA damage that was known. What we discovered that MRN then loads at the sites of DNA damage, RNA pol 2. And it is an active RNA pol 2 that will transcribe bidirectionally what we call damage induced low non coding RNA from the break and also toward the break. So, double strand breaks are in fact bidirectional transcriptional promoters. And then these RNA are further processed by those Drosch and Dice at the sites of DNA damage by uh, they generate smaller RNA. And this small RNA then can bind back to the unprocessed complementary RNA. And so only when the long RNA is bound to this short RNA, this allows the formation, the coalescence, the accumulation of the proteins at the sites of DNA damage in the form of the DNA damage response foci that we all know very well. And indeed, what we discover that this, this, uh, uh, this foci are in fact uh, uh, liquid blobs, semi-viscous blobs of proteins which are held together by the RNA, which works as a glue. And they are uh, what people call uh, differently condensates or liquid-liquid phase separation events. So again, they are uh, semi-liquid structures, so they're not rock solid structures in the glue that, that keeps this uh, uh, viscous semi-liquid uh, um, uh, spheres, uh, globular spheres, is the RNA which is generated at the sites of DNA damage. And this is what we what we discovered and we published in the past. What we are now characterizing is more in detail, these events. So now we are characterizing a 53 bp one which is, sorry, which is one of the proteins that accumulates at sites of DNA damage and makes these nice dots here in red. And so what we did, we take 53-1, which is very big, we chop it in two, bits, in two bits, and we mix all of these bits with RNA to see if we can recreate these, uh, these globular structures in vitro so we can study them. And then now we found one of these fragments that you can see with increasing amounts of RNA recreates 
these uh, blobs, this uh, semi se uh, semi-liquid structure. So now we are characterizing it in more details and we discovered already a mutation which impedes completely the ability of 50 of this fragment of 53B1 to make these, uh, these blobs, these structures, and this it inhibits this formation because it is not able to bind their RNA anymore. So we have a point mutant which impedes the interaction of 53B1 with the RNA, and in this way impairs the, the, the formation of these condensates. Interestingly, this point mutation is also a site of post-translational modification. So now we are testing how this, these events can uh, modulate the formation, the, the interaction with RNA and the formation of these uh, structures. And more speculatively, but probably more interestingly for us, we are also testing the, the possibility that RNA modifications may be impacting on this. So, so now we are spending a lot of money <laughs> in synthesizing uh, weird RNAs with very weird RNA modifications to see whether they impact on some of these events. But let me go back to this uh, uh, to this scheme here. What I'm telling you is that wherever you break DNA, you will get these proteins that go at the sites of DNA damage. Each one of these dots, it's an individual broken DNA site. Okay. And the proteins are the same. They will go wherever DNA breaks. However, each one of these dots is held together by RNA, which is generated locally at the sites of DNA damage. So all the RNA will be different because the RNA here is made on, the, on a certain chromosome, which is different from this, which is different from this, which is different from this. So this provides us an opportunity to attack the RNA rather than to attack the proteins to control the DNA damage response. And this would allow us a control which is site specific because you are going to kill events at one specific site only. And the approach that we use is to use antisense oligonucleotides to inhibit the functions of these RNA antisense oligonucleotides are now FDA-approved uh, uh, drugs. They are sort of, they, are, they look like RNA, but they are not RNA, they are not DNA, they are, they are weird chemistries that bind avidly to the RNA and impedes this RNA to work properly, to function within the cell, okay? So they bind to this RNA, they, they disengage this RNA from their interaction with the proteins, so they disassemble the, the DNA damage response foci, and so they make essentially melt, since they are liquid, they dissolve, probably, I should say, these structures. And they work in a selective manner, in a secret specific manner, well, to show you just one example to prove this point. So this is one cell in which we can introduce three double strand break. They're all embedded within some synthetic repeats. They are called that repeats. We can cut in the same cell two more times in, 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 in a different locus in which the DNA is, is surrounded, the, the double strand break is surrounded by lack repeats DNA. We can make sure that this DNA is really cut because we see this Chromatin modification event is called gamma stretch, which is not dependent on RNA. So now whatever we do, gamma stretch will stay. It is our sort of positive control. Now in this cells, we will introduce an antisense oligonucleotide against the TET RNAs. And as you can see, the 53B1, which is the one that I showed is dependent on RNA, is not able to be recruited to these sites of DNA damage, which have the TET sequences. However, these two, 53 is able to go and do whatever it does at the sites of DNA damage. So we can control events in a very, very selective way. So when we saw that, we immediately thought we should extend this observation to telomere biology, because I mentioned before that telomere biology, so the damage of the telomeres is the most impactful because this flux site, they may be repaired, but the telomeric damage is really hard to repair. So it has a lot of consequences, makes cells age, makes cells senesce, causes inflammation. So the idea is now that when telomeres become dysfunctional because too short of damage, they will activate a DNA damage response, which will depend on these telomeric transcripts, which are induced only when telomeres are damaged, okay? So now we can design an antisense oligonucleotide, a telomeric azo, that by binding to this RNA, they will disengage this RNA from the proteins that is usually associated with, and essentially disengage, inactivate, switch off the alarm, inactivate the DNA damage response, but importantly, in a selective manner, only at the telomeres. If you, I'll show you some evidence now of efficacy, but this is 
efficacy only for telomeric DNA damage, okay? Any other sites of DNA damage within the cell will not be bothered, will not be impacted by this treatment. So uh, first example the, of, of, to show you, to prove you the efficacy of this approach. So we use the one mouse model in which we can selectively and inducibly induce DNA damage in telomeres. Telomeres are protected by a protein, which is called TRF2, that sits on the telomeres. If you remove TRF2, suddenly these are not telomeres anymore, are exposed DNA ends, and they trigger a DNA damage response. So in this mice, we introduce uh, the, the loss of TRF2, and then we, at the same time, we treat them. This mice with our antisense oligonucleotide, and then we collect the tissues. And I think this is kidney. And so you see that we, uh, when the, uh, these are happy mice with, with, with TRF2, and so there is no DNA damage response. As soon as you remove TRF2 and you don't treat them, you see there is a very strong DNA damage response, which, are, however, is strongly, strongly reduced in the tissues of mice treated with this antisense oligonucleotide, actually two different kinds, and this is the quantification. So this is exciting for us because for the first time we can uncouple DNA damage from its consequences, the DNA damage response. And therefore we have a tool to address any disease, any condition, any a, a, anything that you are studying that you may be thinking, ah, maybe what I'm observing is dependent on telomeric DNA damage response activation. Now you have a pill, you have an inhibitor that you can give to your cells, to your mice, to, we use it in different animals, even zebra fishes. I'm not sure I will have the time to show you the results today. And we can switch off the alarm of a dysfunctional tumor. So we, we extended this observation to start to use this, this approach in many different models. Intentionally, one of the first models that we wanted to study was a complex disease in which many things go wrong. So this is called hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome. You have the telomeric dysfunction, you have the heterochromatic loss, you have the nuclear shape, which is screwed up. And nobody was really sure whether the telomeric dysfunction was playing any significant, meaningful physiological role to this disease. So we treated mice with this mutation, which undergo premature aging. And what we observed that with this approach, we could extend nearly 50% to the maximum lifespan of these mice. So these mice certainly do not live as wild type, but certainly we are extending their life. So that the short answer to the question, is telomeric DNA damage playing a role? Yes, it does. It's not the only cause of this disease, of this condition, but certainly it plays a role. Luckily, HGPS is a very rare disease, but there are very many conditions which are associated, to say the least, if not caused in some in some other occasions, by tumor dysfunction. And uh, during the pandemic, we have plenty of time to read the literature, and uh, uh, so we combed a large body of, of, of literature in which results were a bit uh, scattered. So intentionally, we 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 decided to um, not synthesize, but some in some in somehow to to uh, uh, put them in in a more structured manner. Uh, all, all, all the results from uh, scattered again from the literature and the evidence it's it's really compelling. There are a number of diseases in which certainly there is a strong association between telomeric DNA damage, cell senescence accumulation, and the disease. And often in some cases the the the, the the relationship is a causative one. And probably the best example is the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we have done some experiments on aplastic anemia. We're working on Alzheimer's disease, but today we'll be discussing mainly lung and immune uh, the hematopoietic system. So very briefly about IPF, although probably I'm embarrassed to speak in front of Marco that knows this is way better than me, but it's a chronic and progressive uh, disease. Um, it has no, essentially no cure, and it has a very short, uh, large expectancy after the diagnosis, few years. So it's really like some, some cancers. It's, it's really, really, really bad. There are two main treatments that work to an extent, but I understand they uh, merely slow down the progression. Sh certainly they do not cure, and the real only cure is uh, lung transplantation, I understand. So this is so this is a, a, a serious disease with no uh, 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 a, not not a very good available treatment for these patients. What's the link with IPF uh, uh, with uh, telomere biology? Well, there is plenty of it. So IPF patients 
invariably display markers of telomeric DNA damage response activation, they accumulate senescent cells and inflammation. Um, the invariably, and this is really one of the hallmarks, the, their tumors, both in the lungs and in circulating PBMCs, uh, their tumors are shorter than the average of a healthy patient. So there is a telomeric maintenance defect. And indeed, the short tumors is an established risk factor for these diseases. And one third of familiar cases and one, uh, and one fourth of the sporadic cases, their tumors are shorter than the 10% of the average population. That means very, very, very short. And in, again, consistently, I think I'm going to show you some slides in this regard. Patients with the shortest telomeres are really behaving worse than uh, patients with a similar condition, IPF again, condition, but with longer telomeres. So even when transplanted, they will survive less well. And importantly, and this for a molecular biologist, probably that is the most important evidence, Patients with IPF often carry genetic mutations, germline mutation, tumor biology genes, including telomerase. So these are individuals are really telomerase mutant individuals that are unable to maintain their telomeres long. Okay. And, and there is also some evidence from mouse models that if you remove senescent cells from uh, uh, IPF mouse models, uh, you rescue the phenotype. So that supports again, the causality of the accumulation of senescent cells or the development of this disease. So this is what I was saying. So this is the tumor length in the normal population. You see with age, your tumors get shorter and shorter. If you look at the familiar cases or the sporadic cases, clearly patients tend to have shorter tumors. And, and here in the, the red, uh, sorry, the, the black circle are the patients with a telomerase. Mute, mutation, so they, they clearly have very short tumors. And as I was mentioning before, in three independent cohorts, so these are patients with long, medium, or short tumors, this is the survival of the population with a short tumor. So short tumors is not a good idea if you have a period. And the data come over and over again, very, very consistent. A few months ago, again, an additional population stressing once again what I told you. So the results are really, really consistent. There is a very clear link between telomer, short telomeres and uh, uh, lung fibrosis. So we thought we should adopt uh, uh, an animal model of telomeric shortening. And so we adopted the telomerase knockout mice. So this is the RNA component of telomerase. So we uh, adopted this mouse. We didn't generate it. Some other people generated it and to an extent also characterized it. It's the problem with this, this model is mice start with very long tumors. So if you knock out the telomerase, tumors are still okay-ish. So you have to breed generations and generations until the tumors become sufficiently short to trigger a problem. So we use the third generation of this knockout, telomerase knockout mice. We treated them when they were uh, uh, youngish, so around three months of age with eight injections, systemic injections of our antisense oligonucleotide, and it is unassisted, so it's not uh, nanoparticles, it's really a needle in the belly of these mice. And then we collected tissues at different eight uh, times after the uh, treatment. I'm going to focus our analysis on the last time point taken, which is nine months after the last treatment, so when mice are nine months of age. Um, First thing first, do, the, do these mice with short telomeres accumulate markers of DNA damage response activation in their lungs? And can we make an impact on them? And the answer is yes. So this is, these are lungs staying with three, uh, uh, two independent markers, 50 to one and phospho cap one. There is very little of it in normal tissues. The telomerase knockout mice, which have been treated with a control antisense oligonucleotide, which is not effective, they show significant increase for these stainings that is quantified here, while the mice that have been treated with our antisense oligonucleotide show a reduction in the TDR. So clearly we can control the DNA damage response activation in the lungs of these mice with these antisense oligonucleotide treatments. This is at the molecular level, so the DNA damage response is down, but how is the, the lungs, how is the histology of the lungs? Well, you can see that when uh, the, the, the lungs of uh, IPF 
Well, not the pivot. The telomer is not called mice. Have the structure, so you you lose some of these structures here, so you can count the number of air spaces, which is reduced in this knockout mice, which is to a good extent recovered in mice treated with this antisensory equipment. And our pathologist, which I should have mentioned, is Claudio Tipodo, uh, that, by the way, receives all these samples blind and then scores them, give us his feedback. So he collected a number of uh, histopathological analyses that he has then, uh, that uh, some of them are are, are, are uh, mentioned here, and then he summarized them and summed them up in a pathological score. So the higher is this bar, the sicker is the mouse. And of course, each of these circles, uh, I should have mentioned before, is uh, an individual mouse. And as you can see, the, there is a pathological score which is reduced in mice treated with our antisensory nucleotide. And this is paralleled by a reduction in inflammation I mentioned before, but also by the infiltration of immune cells is detected by CD45. Why am I mentioning inflammation? Because chronic inflammation is really the cause of the disease that causes eventually fibrosis. So we perform an RNA seq experiment on sample from these uh, lungs, uh, from these mice, untreated or treated to see whether the SAS, the senescent associated secretory phenotype, was, was there and was impacted by our treatments. And we observe that indeed, so. Uh, in red means things are going up. So you see an increase of all these pathways that I'm not sure you can read, but you can see PGF beta uh, and, and, and to look into start signaling pathways, uh, uh, complement inflammatory response, IL-6 check status, TNF alpha. So the entire pro-inflammatory pathways are significantly up when you compare wild type with the knockouts and they are significantly controlled, brought down to normal in our azo treatment. So we see less DDR, we see less inflammation, and of course we were very curious then to see whether the fibrotic, whether the fibrosis was impacted. So fibrosis can be detected by staining, by a technique known as muscle strichrom staining. And these are the results. Again, each of the circle is a mouse. So these are wild type mice. These are the Telomerase knockout mice, when we start treating them, when they are relatively young, they're already a bit fibrotic, not massively, but certainly they're not normal. They are certainly, so we are treating some sick mice to an extent already. This uh, disease is, is, a, is, a, is a progressive disease. So with age, mice, when they are, for instance, 12 months of age, either untreated or treated with a control antisensory group that have progressed, so their fibrosis have increased. However, mice that have been treated with our antisensory nucleotide, the two different ones, you see a decrease in, the, in their fibrosis. So we can probably safely say that we can stop the progression of the lung fibrosis, and that would be already probably something relevant also at the, at the clinical level, but if you squeeze your eyes and you are optimistic as we are, you can see that in fact, we are going below, below the initial level. So to an extent, we could also revert a condition which allegedly was a mild condition, but nevertheless, we think we are able possibly to make an impact. So this is where we are now. This is unpublished. Of course, we have to do many more uh, um, studies, uh, but we think this is, uh, uh, interesting, and we are optimistic about the potential of this approach. So, as I mentioned, we 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 have been focusing our analysis on uh, IPF, but I also mentioned that telomeric shortening has an important impact also on the hematopoietic system. Often, patients we were discussing before have a, a compounded condition of uh, lung fibrosis, but also an impaired immune system, and more in general, an hematopologic uh, um, uh, problem. So we have been looking also at the immune system. We have been looking both at the bone marrow and the spleen of these mice. And of course, our pathologist, Claudio, you can see differences in this, which is very hard for me. Maybe here I can see a difference. So this is the white pulp of the spleen, which is strongly compromised here, and to an extent is rescued here. In this uh, telomerase uh, uh, um, treated, telomerase knockout mice. And again, this is the quantification of the pathological score that once again shows that we are making a good impact on them. 
uh, a cloud is, uh, is an immunologist, so he's very keen on this side. Uh, and so he is now together with us. We are uh, together. We are characterizing the different component of the uh, of the immune system in the bone marrow, in the bone marrow, and the spleen. I will not go through all this all this uh, uh, analysis. Suffice to say that the pattern is is fairly consistent. You have a, a normal condition. The telomerase knockout is certainly different, and to a good extent, the treated mice go back closer to the normal condition. They are never going back to zero pathology, but certainly they get closer. And also here we are performing RNA-seq experiments and certainly we'll have probably uh, study more in detail the different pool of cells, but also here if you do a bulk RNA-seq experiment, this is in this case from the spleen, you see the induction of pro-inflammatory inflammatory pathways, which are then controlled significantly by uh, our treatments. How and so you get also here uh, inflammation, and you see that uh, if I go back here to this slide, there are many different cell types that are all impacted by our treatment. And honestly, when I saw this, I thought maybe we have such a, a broad impact because we are impacting on the stem cells of the hematological system, and that's why we the, 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 this impact can now reverberate through the more. Uh, differentiated progenitor, the more differentiated cells. So we tested recently whether we could uh, study the uh, fitness of the immune cells of these mice. So we take the bone marrow of these mice and we put them in, uh, we, we perform a test for a colony formation assay. So colony CFU, colony forming unit assay. We see that equal amounts of bone starting material, of course, bone marrow. You have a sort of 100 colonies, in wild type mice, the knockouts certainly have less colonies. The control ASO, as expected, doesn't do really much. But the uh, uh, telomeric ASO control, uh, treated mice, you have a very good rescue in the fitness of these uh, stem cells. So we think we are making a broad impact on the so different components of the immune system because, again, we are impacting on the fitness of the, of the, of the bombardment. So this is... Uh, at least for us, uh, um, encouraging and, and exciting. But of course, these are mice, and we were keen as much as possible to extend our observations to, to human conditions. So, so far, we have only one experiment running. And I apologize. So, this is a duplicate, but actually, we just received the triplicate, which is supportive of this. So, we should update this slide. So, what we did was to take uh, from elderly patients CD34. A positive cell. So these are the uh, hematopoi hematopoietic stem cells in humans from the bone marrow. And then we treat these uh, CD34 positive cells ex vivo for one week with our antisense oligonucleotides, and then we plate them for colonies. And as you can see, there is a, with increasing <coughs> amounts of these oligos, there is an increasing ability of these uh, cells to make both red colonies and possibly also white colonies. Again, this is uh, ongoing. We are also characterizing the DNA damage response in the cells and the telomere biology. But we think that, again, um, again now having also have this in the triplicate, I think we can safely say that we, it seems that also with this approach, with an ex vivo treatment, we can also impact uh, on human uh, samples. So, to conclude this part, we think that the tumors are really the, the uh, ultimate vulnerability in the genome because they are the irreparable portion of the irreplaceable components of very fitting uh, uh, <laughs> with this uh, cartoon here. And uh, we think we have a, a way to control the DNA damage response selectively at the tumors, so also in in vivo settings. And again, we have extended this observation uh, in, in, in many different animal models, uh, um, mice uh, of different diseases, today I showed you telomerase knockouts. We have a different model for uh, aplastic anemia, which is an anemia caused by telomeric shortening. And also there we can make an impact. And we have, in my opinion, a super interesting story in zebrafish, in which we can make an impact on, on the global development when zebrafish have a mutation in the telomerase gene as well. So let me now slightly 
change gear just to give a summary of our fantastic collaboration with the ICGB here in Trieste about COVID because we, we thought that with a pandemic, we really wanted to probe whether tumor biology could make an impact being our lab essentially a tumor biology lab. So we, we developed so far two set of observations. The first one is related to the, to the fact that the elderly are more prone to, to the, to the infection. And of course, that it could be for many reasons. The immune system, for instance, is probably an excellent explanation. But we also observed that uh, um, ACE2, which is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, is increased in the lungs of the elderly compared to the humans, to the, to the young uh, uh, people. And this applies both to humans and also to mice. So. As you get old, you, uh, you accumulate more ACE2, and then ACE2 is the receptor. However, probably, again, it's not correct to say that as you get old, because what we observed, that if you take mice of the same age, wild type, or telomerase knockout, these mice have much higher levels of ACE2. So what we discovered that telomeric DNA damage, but in fact, any kind of DNA damage triggers the expression of ACE2. So in other words, if you take the promoter of ACE2, you place it in, in front of luciferase, and you stick this construct in silly HeLa cells, you irradiate them, you see more luciferase. So the promoter of ACE2 responds to DNA damage and boosts the expression of the uh, ACE2 gene. And, and since with age, you accumulate DNA damage, telematic shortening as well, and you this triggers the DR, we think this may explain the higher levels of ACE2 in the end of the day. We extended, of course, this observation to our telomeric case of treated mice. So by reducing the telomeric DDR, can we control ACE2 level? And the answer is yes. So these are uh, telomeric knockout mice, which have been treated with this antisensory glucotides. And as you can see, ACE2 levels, uh, the, the levels of ACE2 are reduced. So this was one story. The second story was, uh, uh, it was really triggered by a really a, a, a large body of results emerging from the literature, which was linking a viral infection with the establishment of cellular senescence. And being a senescence lab, we, we were really curious to understand which were the causes of such senescence establishment because it was really not uh, being published by anybody. So many people observed cellular senescence, but they didn't really provide a mechanistic uh, insight into what was really causing it. And so we started a, co a collaboration with uh, initially Sandra to, to study the, uh, the molecular events following SARS-CoV-2 infection. And which generated very many Western blots, and certainly I will not go through all of them. The message is that yes, SARS-CoV-2 infection causes DNA damage in the cell. This DNA damage triggers a DNA damage response, but it is an aberrant, atypical, weird DNA damage response. This is because the virus also not only breaks DNA, but also uh, 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 plays with the cells and tries to uh, control the DNA damage signaling events. And um, okay, probably I'll, I'll skip the details, but basically, if you are a DNA damage person, well, I go through the details. And if you are a DNA damage person, you see that ATM gets activated, but check two, which should really be its necessary downstream target of ATM phosphorylation. It is not phosphorylated. And for in, in similar way, ATR is not getting activated despite uh, RPA is the normal, most physiological activator of ATR. So you have the substrate for ATR activation, phosphorylated RPA, but you don't get ATR again. And in the middle, many other weird things go on. So uh, DNA damage activation, but also an altered uh, response to such DNA damage and probably the best example, in addition to the two that I just mentioned, is CHEC1. So CHEC1 is a, an important mediator of the DNA damage response. It's reduced in levels in infected cells, and CHEC1 controls the levels of RM2, which is the ribonucleotide reductase uh, cofactors, which controls the balance between RNTP levels and DNTP levels. 
So the virus is, why, is, why is it happening? Because the virus is an RNA virus, likes RNA, likes RNTP, wants RNTP to promote its own replication. So hijacks the systems in the cell in order to boost RNTP. And the consequence is, since the, 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 the amount of nucleotide precursors is the same, if RNTP levels go up, DNTP levels need to go down in the cell. Indeed, we measure the DNTP levels in the cells and they are, upon infection, they are reduced and this causes an arrest in S phase. So you get a lot of cells which are in S phase, but they are stuck. They do not incorporate the RDU because again, they, they are running out of fuel. They are running out of DNTP and the lack of DNTP is really the cause of DNA damage because if you provide exogenously DNTP to the cells, you see that while check one stays down, Phospho-RPA is to an extent rescued and also gamma h 2 x is to an extent reduced. And also importantly, the DNA damage in these cells is also going down. So the lack of DNTP is really the cause of the DNA damage generation. DNA damage that triggers the DNA damage response, that triggers the senescence establishment, that triggers, I mentioned before, uh, inflammation. So senescence cells have this SASP that promotes the, the synthesis, the expression of, of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we tested that also in our hands. And as you can see, you get the SIGA sting a positive micronuclei in infected cells. This is a well-known pathway that promotes inflammation in the cells. And in cells lacking SIGA sting, we observe nevertheless that phosphostat or P38 are engaged in the cells uh, upon infection. Again, these are all pathways that lead to the synthesis of cytokines that we have actually measured. And this is, I should stress, this is a log scale. You can see the amount, the, the level of induction that is induced by uh, the infection with SARS-CoV-2. And again, with the NTP supplementation, this induction is to a good extent reduced. So, simple message, SARS-CoV-2 breaks DNA. However, mentioned before, DNA is repairable. So, why the virus is not repairing it and coping with that? Well, what we discover that in addition to breaking DNA, uh, something funny happens to 53P1, which is a protein which is necessary to repair DNA damage. So, you infect the cells, this foci of 50 to be one are not observed while gamma to x is induced. And usually they go in parallel, you get an induction. So if you take cells, you irradiate them with x-rays, you see an increase of gamma to x, but also an increase of 50 to be one. In this case, we were uh, observing only gamma to x going up, not 50 to be one. And then we observe that if you express only one protein of the virus, the N protein, this protein is sufficient for this theater here. <coughs> You, and you radiate the cells, again, gamma to x goes up, but the cells expressing the end protein are not able to increase the number of 53 bp one foci. Why is that? Because I mentioned before, 51 needs the RNA generated as cells of DNA damage in order to make the foci. But the virus expresses uh, a, a very abundant and avid RNA binding protein, which is, again, this end protein. And so we discovered that the end protein is able to bind to our damage-induced London coding RNA. And indeed, when you overexpress the end protein, 53B1 is not able anymore to bind to the d link RNA because it competes. End protein is so avid that it binds to the d link RNA. 53B1 cannot access it, cannot make foci. And indeed, when you test the function of 53B1 in order to Re, to, to rejoin, to repair DNA damage, well, 51 is in functions are strongly reduced. This kind of drop that is observed when you are expressing the end protein, well, it's the same drop that you observe when you knock out 51. So it's a, it's a significant problem. And again, thanks to the collaboration also with the, with the, with the Serena, we extend these observations not only in mice, but most importantly, in uh, in uh, in humans, so we observe that in, in the lungs and in the nasal mucosa of uh, uh, COVID patients, there is an, an increase in gamma H2X and, uh, and the reduction of 50 cubic one as well. So to summarize this uh, second very last part, what we have 
uh, proposed is that uh, upon infection, you, uh, the virus causes a loss of this protein, check one, and we have characterized two different mechanism. And this loss of check one leads to a reduction of the NTP because again, the virus wants to boost the RNTP. The consequence is a reduction of the NTP. And this causes a problem to, to the DNA replication process. In parallel to this DNA damage generation mechanism, there is an impaired DNA repair because the end protein binds to the D-link RNA impairs a 53 big one force formation, less repair, so you have more DNA damage, which is not getting repaired, so you get more DNA damage accumulation, and therefore the establishment of cell senescence, and of course the inflammatory response, which is associated with cell senescence, which is what I mentioned right now several times in my presentation. Most important slide of all is this. So these are the people in my lab and the, the, the unpublished part, maybe I should mention, but Tumor biology and fibrosis has been led by uh, and Sara Sepe, Francesca Rossello, with the help of Giada Ciccio. I stop here, not without first saying that we are always, in particular in this period, looking for uh, collaborators at the PhD and also postdoctoral level. So if any of you is interested, please come forward and I'll be happy to take your questions.